Hello and welcome to our latest Insider interview. Today in the studio, I have with me Keith Ashworth-Lord, who is full manager of the CFP SDL UK Buffetology Fund. Keith, thanks for coming in today. Thanks for inviting me, Carl. In your latest update to investors, you mentioned that you're redoubling your efforts to war game how robust the companies you hold in the fund are in the face of the changing macroeconomic environment. Could you talk us through that? And has that led to some companies exiting the fund? Yes, uh, is, the, is the answer to both. Um, it's not the first time we've done this. We did it when lockdown was, uh, was, was striking and we looked at the portfolio to see if there was anything that we felt wouldn't come out the other side. So we did actually, we, we've done this before, but specifically what, what we were interested in is, you know, we think we are going into a recession, well, we think we're in a recession and we think it could be, you know, prolonged. It could last through 2023, maybe even into early 2024. So we, we looked at all our companies, which are going to be prone to recession, um, you know, where where is uh, demand likely to falter? What's the financial situation of those companies currently? And we did, we, we, we've actually looked at three, um, I can only mention two because one we're still, we're still working on, but two of the businesses that, that we've let go. Uh, one is TriFast, which has literally been in the portfolio since day one. Um, the reason we did that was this was a business that historically has been founded on modest organic growth. Uh, it's supplemented that with, with really quite decent acquisitions and the classic two and two equals more than four. And they've had a very successful track record of doing that under the previous management. That all seems to have ground to a halt. And what really concerned us was was the measures that we dearly love, you know, like growth was faltering, margins were, were faltering, return on equity was slipped into single figures. Uh, the business had a very high stock level and really escalated debt levels, not where you want to be going into a recession. So that was one business that reluctantly we decided to part company with. Another one where perhaps the, you know, the, it's not quite such a, a shock was Victrex. Victrex again has been in since very early doors from the early months. Um, it's a business again that has been struggling to make meaningful growth. Um, it's exposed to automotive, it's exposed to aerospace. It's got some mega projects which were supposed to be the, the you know the, the great hope for the future which it all seems to be jammed tomorrow. Um, so it is a cyclical business and we decided that that was one where perhaps we could get better returns elsewhere. So those are a couple of examples of where our war gaming has, uh, has led to action. The UK is in a recession and it's expected to be in a recession for potentially two years. Does this make you wary of investing in consumer facing companies? Very much so. I mean, we don't have that much consumer facing because one of the consequences of um, the, the, the lockdown review that I mentioned was that we deliberately cut our exposure to directly facing consumer businesses. And it really left us with just uh, Jet2, and I suppose you could say Diageo, but um, very wary about the outlook for consumer spending because of the squeeze on the cost of living uh, and inflation. But as I say, we went into it really with not that exposed a position to the consumer, at least directly. And as well as Diageo, is there any other stocks you would highlight that you think could potentially weather the recession? Yeah, I mean, the two I would mention, uh, one is our American, one of our two American companies, a business called Rollins. It's a pest control business, rat catcher and bug catcher and everything. And uh, as you probably know, you know, I spent some of my time in Florida. And if we didn't have uh, our house regularly debugged like every month, I mean, we'd be overrun. But it's not just residential, it's commercial. You know, you can get shut down if you if you have rats in the kitchen. So Rollins has sailed through recession after recession. Growth maybe slows a little during a recession, but nonetheless, it continues to grow through recessions. And I believe it would do the same this time. And the second business that I think is pretty immune to recession is, is a business called Bioventix that we own. Um, it's probably the smallest company in the fund, actually. Bioventix makes high affinity monoclonal antibodies. Uh, in a nutshell, they're used in blood tests. Uh, so, you know, you will go to your GP, you'll have a blood test. It'll be run on a machine and it'll see whether, you know, whether you've got something like vitamin D deficiency or, or you could even have had a heart attack and didn't know it, but, but it's in your blood. There's the marker there. And their products actually 
uh, bond with the antigens, this antibody antigen, they bond together and the machine reads it and it can detect whether you've got an ailment. And the reason I think that it's going to be relatively immune to recession is that these blood tests will carry on all the time during a recession. The interesting thing is actually that, you know, those two companies I've given you there, I mean, Rollins is a huge company. It's, uh, it's US and it's mm -hmm. very large. Yeah. And Biventix is UK and it's very small. As I say, the smallest in our portfolio. Games Workshop is your top holding and it's a position you've held in the fund since launch um, 12 years ago. Is this a company that you could never envisage selling? Absolutely. And it's also a company that we probably have more questions about because it's so poorly understood uh, in general. You know, it, it's, a business, it, it's a business that has a very, very, very loyal customer base who spend on the, on the hobby through thick and thin, the wargaming hobby. And the recent, the recent big news is, is the potential tie up with Amazon. They've been uh, exploiting their IPR in a number of ways over several years, but I mean this this potentially is very big, you know, leading to leading to movies um, and, and and Amazon getting behind it. Uh, without wishing to use a pun, but I will. I mean, it could be a game changer for Games Workshop. It really could if if it comes off. So that that is a business that I think is exceedingly well run. It has a very loyal customer base. It's incredibly profitable. Um, my, my great fear is that we lose it to a takeover at some point, but I don't think that's likely in the short term. And of the 27 holdings in the fund, how many have you held since launch? If we, if we say by launch the first month or first couple of months, we've got seven in the portfolio. Uh, and those seven uh, are Games Workshop, James Holstead, RWS Holdings, NCC Group, uh, Diageo, Croda and Lion Trust Asset Management. And then there's another three, AG Bar, Decra and Jet2, which have been in the portfolio for over 10 years, but weren't bought in, in the very first year. And there's been some takeovers over the 12 year period. So I think if there, were, if there weren't those takeovers, that number might have actually been higher. Yeah, for example, we lost HomeServe this year um, to, to, uh, to private equity. And that was, that was a business. I, I was, I was desperate not to see that one go, but that, that was one, you know, we bought very early doors. Uh, so that, that one has certainly gone. Uh, we've lost Motivecom, Latchways, um, Lavenden, and what's the other one? There's, there's another one. I, mean, I think we've lost five in total uh, and all early doors. We've not had any sort of let's get in and let's get out quick, you know, none of that. Given the investment approach, you're clearly a Warren Buffett fan. But as an active fund manager, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on Warren Buffett's views on active funds versus passive funds. He said in the past that he thinks that the majority of investors should just simply buy an S&P 500 index fund. What are your thoughts on that? I think for a no little investor, um, I think that is very good advice indeed, because they might not have the expertise and the wherewithal to pick out individual companies, individual stocks, uh, or indeed funds to invest in. And they might get tempted to churn, um, which you know, you, you're know you at risk of being whipsawed if you do that, if you're trying to sell at the top and buy at the bottom and all this sort of nonsense. So I think for the, for the ordinary um, Joe Public who wants equity exposure, I think it's very good advice. Uh, but I think for anyone who has got um, or believes they've got some expertise um, in analysing companies and valuing shares, um, I think it's it's not good advice at all. And, and it's, it's quite noticeable, isn't it? I mean, Berkshire Hathaway has got a, a, a portfolio of marketable securities. It doesn't have a portfolio of index funds. And finally, a question that we ask all fund managers that we interview, do you have skin in the game? I do indeed. I mean, every single bit of my family's net worth um, in terms of equity investments is in the shares uh, of the fund. So, you know, skin in the game. I mean, I eat my own cooking. I've suffered very painfully this last year or 15 months. You know, I've felt it the same way as investors in the fund have felt because I'm one of them. And as I say, um, everything, all our equity exposure, my family and I, is, is in the fund. Keith, thanks for your time today. Thank you. That's all we have time for. You can check out the rest of our insider interviews on our YouTube channel where you can like and subscribe. Hopefully, see you next time.